man like a tree is nourished by his roots. His roots grow in different parts of the world. The branches of his family tree spread out over thousands of years and kilometers. But he considers himself a son of the Kazakh land, the land where the nomads of the Great Steppe reached the highest goals. Arman Umarkojev, traveler, historian, archaeologist in the new season of the Kandala project. The word book has long been used in a figurative sense, which makes sense because a book is a source of knowledge. So why shouldn't we think of everything we learn and receive information from as a book? The topic of this episode is the clay book. Today we will talk about the history and features of traditional Kazakh ceramics. Archaeologist Marina Bedelbaeva will help us to read this book and decipher its message. Marina, if we open the very first page of the clay book, what can it tell us? I think that the clay book, the invention of clay products, especially ceramics, can probably be put on a par with such major discoveries of mankind as the invention of the wheel, the advent of the steam engine and the advent of the personal computer. Marina Bidilbaeva, archaeologist, candidate of historical sciences, works at the Sararka Archaeological Institute at Karaganda State University, head of the Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography. Most ancient pottery is usually fired, molded roughly and made of very thick dough, shamut, with the addition of grass. So, first clay products were molded. They were originally egg-shaped. These were vessels with pointy bottoms. When people put such pots with food on a surface, they tipped over and everyone was hungry again. And then the question arose, what to do, how to solve this? In fact, the whole development of humanity consists of questions that have been solved correctly. They solved this one correctly. They invented flat-bottomed vessels. Once there was a flood in Jeskazgan region near the village of Taldesai. When the water receded, it washed out some of the surface and uncovered clay or rather ceramics, crocs. And that's how that famous settlement of metallurgists was discovered, just because of these ceramics. The Taldesai settlement is wonderful. You began talking about it, and my mind immediately made a reference to Noah's Ark. And there was a flood, and these things were preserved. But it really is a very interesting settlement, which was very well studied by the efforts of Almaty, Jeskazran, Karaganda and Russian colleagues. They found parts of pottery, which were used for casting metal, that is, special lyachkas made of ceramics with a spout. They even had drops of metal preserved in them. То есть это значит специальные лячки, изготовленные из керамики с носиком, где вот сохраняются даже капли металла. I've often seen signs of repair on ancient pottery. If we break it today, we throw it away because it's easy to replace, but at that time it was apparently not. I've seen these staples on clay crocs that are supposed to hold them together. When you see this, you realize how resource-efficient ceramics used to be. We're the trash civilization now, and we throw things away without question. Our possessions last us a day. Back then, you're right, they used to repair their ceramics. If you take an archaeological pot, 
an intact one from a burial site, you can see that not just one, but sometimes two or three pieces were clipped with a special clasp. You can't pour water or liquids in it anymore, but you can use it for other products. I want to invite you to a museum of the Sararqa Archaeological Institute, where the most representative collection of the Bronze Age is displayed, where real professionals work. According to archaeological studies, what is the most ancient crockery found in the world and in Kazakhstan in particular? The official science states that products from burnt clay appeared in the 4th millennium BC in Mesopotamia. It then spread to Iran, India and ancient Greece. So we can safely say that the concept of the Neolithic Revolution in the Neolithic period, which is 5th to 3rd millennia BC, is also connected with the appearance of ceramic production. We can probably claim that human civilization as we know it began with this stunning discovery that clay can be used to make something and not just anything but useful everyday items. An analogy from Bible comes to my mind, when it was out of clay that the Lord created men. There is also a parallel with the painter Pablo Picasso, who, at the age of 60, while continuing to paint with brushes, turned to clay. He explained his motivation for the transition, that he feels himself a god when he sculpts something from clay. He expresses his soul in these forms. Ancient people probably felt the same way. In the clay book, preserved some aphorisms, some lines from that time in those items, in dishes or in statuettes of that time that we now can see. Определенные афоризмы, реплики этого времени в тех вещах, посуде или статуэтках, которые мы имеем из того времени. At first, it was just an object useful in everyday life, and then it became a beautiful object, useful in everyday life, which also reflected some cultural influences of this or that area. In fact, the semantics of the ornament is a complex and interesting topic, which encompasses the knowledge of art historians and ornamentalists. You are right. Most likely, we have not yet fully read the information encoded in the geometric ornamentation of ancient vessels from the very beginning. But it is there. This ability to read the ornaments, that is, to write them first and then to read them, is this the very first type of ancient writing, the proto-writing of mankind? Украшения по венчику символизировали, предположим, верхний мир, да, тулова сосуда – это земной мир, и вот э, нижний мир – это э, как бы донышко сосуда и э, нижний фриз. Сама символика орнамента. Э, удивительно, что это был… The ornaments on the corolla symbolized, let's say, the upper world, the heaven, the body of the vessel, the world of men, and the bottom of the vessel and the lower frieze, the underworld. As for the symbolism of the ornament, surprisingly, it was only geometric ornamentation. That is, originally, in archaeological pottery of the Bronze Age, we do not find any zoomorphic motifs, let alone anthropomorphic ones. Although in ancient Greece we see a huge number of vessels depicting red and black figures, which reflect the legends and myths of ancient Greece. They had both gods and heroes. And we are able to read it all because of the surviving writing. The ceramic fragments and the pottery itself, in this case, serve as a culturally defining attribute. I like one analogy that I like to repeat. 
If I hold a Kazakh bowl in one hand and a Chinese porcelain in the other, we can immediately identify both the ethnic and geographical indicators, right? Because the ornamentation and the shape. Такой вот аналог, который не самой нравится. Если я в одной руке буду держать казахскую пиалу, а в другой руке китайский фарфор. Мы же с вами сразу определим и этнический показатель, и географический показатель, да? Потому что орнамент, потому что форма. Everything will, of course, be different. This is a well of information, and we are gradually learning to extract it. When applying the ornament, each shape of the jug has its own specific pattern. At the same time, the ornaments for pottery and for felt were very different. The jugs did not have heavy, coarse ornaments, only gentle, light patterns. This was done to match the exquisite shape of a jug. If the shape of the vessel is complex, the ornamentation should be light, so that when a person looks at it, he feels as though the jug is light. This is in the Oterar style, when most often the ornaments took shape of sun symbols, wavy lines and ram's horn. What impact did the Silk Road have on the development of pottery? And can we also talk about the globalization of the pottery market at that time? Мы можем говорить о глобальности древнего мира и средневековья с полным правом. То есть это We can rightfully talk about the globalization of the ancient world during the Middle Ages. This process can be proven archaeologically. It is certain that the centers of ceramic production, craft production, production for exchange and production for sale were the medieval cities in the south of Kazakhstan. These were the cities of the Otrar oasis. Sauran, Sarnach, Karautobe, Karamirgen. I am amazed that now you can walk through the ruins of these settlements and you can find ceramics right under your feet. You can take it home as a souvenir. This means that the mass production of ceramics at that time managed to provide all the townspeople with the necessary set of utensils and wares, and also allowed for exchange. If we talk about the artistic styles of ceramic art, is it possible to say that each region individually has its own style? For example, we can say that the Oterar oasis that you mentioned had its own style. This cultural monument has been studied very well. Albums representing Otrar's ceramics have been published, which included giant chums, which were used for different purposes. Some items of ceramic production were used to build baths, meaning they installed sewage pipes made of ceramics, and we can see the traces of it now. There were also huge rooms acting as pantries, stacked with ceramic vessels that were dug into the ground, specifically to provide provide preservation of food products, such as maybe dairy, maybe wine, maybe some other products. But this all was documented by scientists. And the pottery of the Otrar oasis is an easel pottery, made with a potter's wheel, with reddish-white angob. Later, people started making glazed ceramic dishes, which had some symbols that can be interpreted as writing. This is a very good indicator that there were connections that united the whole Muslim world by that time. We discussed this with the archaeologist Karl Baipakov once, and he said that these symbols that can be viewed as writing are an imitation of Arabic script. The porter was unlikely to know Arabic, as it was an exclusive knowledge, so he just imitated the letters without understanding their meaning. The early medieval, medieval and late medieval history of Otrar is quite well reflected in written sources, and we have full confirmation thanks to archaeological research. The ceramic workshops comprised entire quarters, where the masters made not only crockery, but also sewage pipes, lamps, some ceramic cult objects. It is quite possible that they were making musical instruments, 
the likeness of which we now can find in the Kazakh national musical instruments. All this was produced in the workshops of Otrar ceramists. The workshops had areas where the vessels were covered with ungob coating and where they were left to dry before they would be burned and then would become the final product. This was proven by the dozens of found vessels. The scale of the production proves that this craft in Otrar, as well as in other southern cities of Kazakhstan, was at very high level. В Атрари, как и в принципе во многих других южных городах Казахстана, было поставлено на очень высокий уровень. And they were developing and prospering right up until the moment when Genghis Khan's army came and ruined it all. It took quite a few years to rebuild it after that. Согласно легенде Атрари, according to legend, the library of Atrar was burned, but the clay book, thanks to the ceramists of Atrar, left us some information. In these so-called phrases that were archaeologically found, we will try to decipher. Marina. Marina, it's no coincidence that we are in this particular workshop. This is where the Oterara style is presented in all its glory and the master has something to tell us about it. The peculiarity of the Oterar jugs is that they have a very thin neck and the shape of the vessel is made in the oriental style. Another peculiarity was that milk was used in the firing process, which is when the walls of the jug acquired a beautiful brownish shade. Overall, Oterar pitchers were quite difficult to make because pulling out the thin neck and covering the jug with ornaments requires great skill. Currently, we are working in this direction, studying the Oterar technique, so that in the future we could present our products to the world. The spinning of the porter's wheel reminds me of the spinning of the wheel, which in Kandala program symbolizes the movement of time and the course of history. So, it's time to turn this page of the clay book and move on to the next one. Later on, what other motifs and symbols appeared on Kazakh pottery? Творческие люди были всегда, и поэтому каждый мастер старался привнести нечто необычное, что people have always been creative. So each master tried to bring something unusual to his craft, which on the one hand reflects the traditions and on the other hand acts as his personal signature. For example, ceramic vessels with handles made in zoomorphic style, be it a head of a ram or some other part of an animal, appeared during the Middle Ages. This is the augurses, which which means, if Muslim religion forbade the anthropomorphic motifs in ceramics, like the ones we see in ancient Greece, then people tried to decorate pottery in other ways, using beautiful zoomorphic motifs, which clearly enriched and adorned these ceramic dishes. What are the signs of the original style of a ceramic product? Мне кажется, это масса признаков, и над этим надо серьезно работать. Почему мы же говорим, что у каждого мастера есть свой стиль? I think there are a lot of signs, and they have to be studied. Every master had their own style. Medieval ceramic masters achieved, I would say, the highest levels of craftsmanship. You can determine the school of ceramists based on the shape of the vessel, the thickness of the walls, the clay used, as well as the material added to the clay, the way it was molded. They even used such an indicator as the sound a vessel makes. It's a sign of superior craftsmanship when the ringing sound made by the vessel is loud and long. Значит, такой показатель, как звук, который издает сосуд. То есть, ну, это признак высшего мастерства, когда звон, распространяемый сосудом, он звонкий и долгий. Every craftsman in ancient times had his secrets, which were strictly guarded and passed down only from father to son, from generation to generation. Today all the potters gladly give master classes and sometimes go somewhere to educate themselves. Let us then have a master class.
жалпы құмыра жасаған кезде сазды таңдау өте маңызды нәрсе. In making of a jug, it is very important to choose the right clay. The structure of the clay should have plastic properties. The clay should be very sticky to the touch, and it should be malleable when placed on the porter's wheel. In short, when choosing clay, you should fill it properly with your hands. Each type of clay is different and can be fired at different temperatures. Red clay is fired at the temperature of 1000 degrees white clay and its varieties at the temperature of 1100 degrees. If the clay needs 1000 degrees and we fire it at 900 or 800 degrees, the resulting ceramics will be brittle and it will have a different sound. You can also determine the correct firing by the sound. Marina, why at some point in Soviet era the interest in hand pottery began to decline? Soviet factories working in Kazakhstan come to my mind. I think one such factory was in Kapshagai and one in Kukchitao. This is when mass production of ceramics took root and artisanal production ceased to exist. Traditions were lost which is the most important thing. Meaning this connection, as you said, from father to son, was interrupted by assembly line production. Nevertheless, look at what we have now. Handmade items are certainly valued much more, and a certain number of people realize that if you not only buy pottery from a master, but you also take part in making it, then you can be proud of it. You can keep it at home, show it to your relatives, your children, and inspire them to take part in working with the clay as well. I'll add that I took part in such a masterclass myself. I molded a mug, they fired it for me, and now I drink tea from it. Can you imagine how important it is for children, for whom the development of fine motor skills is a giant step forward? Many young mothers use this to their advantage. I know that a number of ceramists are now working not so much with making ceramics, but teaching and popularizing the process, because their schedules are full. So they've gone from artisans to teachers. Yes, ustaz in Kazakh. Did you like the sound of Saz Sernai? Of course. One Saz Sernai maker says that the type of clay used for the instrument really affects the quality of the sound. I have a go-to gift for my foreign colleagues, and it is a Saz Sernai. When it is played outside of Kazakhstan, I'm always surprised at how much it immerses you into the melody of the step. The sound of the sasernai lets you hear the sound of the wind, the rippling of needle grass, the chirping of birds. And when this instrument is in the hands of a musician like Azamat, and it is made by a master like Azamat, it is really the best gift and a brand of traditional Kazakh culture. So, today the craft of pottery is again in motion and our clay book is filling up with new pages. Я полагаю, что это будет очень большая книга, потому что традиции казахских I think it's going to be a very big book, because the traditions of Kazakh masters, ceramic artisans, have very deep roots, starting from the Neolithic age, gradually turning over the pages of this clay book, we go back to square one, and all that has been lost by previous generations is being restored and let there be new dynasties of masters of ceramic production in Kazakhstan. Uh,